Well, Neil, it's clear that the praise band sings what it wants to sing, when it wants to sing it. So beautiful song. Thank you to uh, our praise band that gives uh, their gifts back to the church, the gifts of song, and what a celebration it is. And yes, it is still Easter season. Every morning is Easter morning from now on. What a blessing it was last week to come together and celebrate resurrection. It, it didn't hurt my feelings that the congregation was absolutely packed as well. That's always uh, fun to have. And we had the big hallelujah chorus at the 1030 service. Uh, the whole chancel area was filled, filled with people who were just singing from their hearts, singing about this good news, singing about resurrection. But the story doesn't end. This week at staff meeting, I gathered together with the staff, and we kind of read the rest of the story. We, we heard about these two guys, not one of the 11, but, but two of the way, two of the people that are part of this movement, and they were journeying back to their homes on this Easter Sunday, a place called Emmaus, and as they were walking there, they were saying to themselves, I can't believe what happened, and those women said he was gone, and, and we didn't see for ourselves, and as they're walking, somebody else comes up, and he's kind of mumbling and says, what are you guys talking about? And they say, were you the only person in Jerusalem who didn't hear about Jesus of Nazareth, how, how they crucified him? Our own leaders crucified him, and he came back to life, evidently. They didn't realize they were walking with the risen Christ. And starting from the very beginning of the scriptures, walked them through all of the words of the prophets and the psalmist to, to let them know that, yes, this is what God has been up to all along, that all of the Bible points to this very fact of resurrection. And suddenly they saw and they flipped out. <laughs> what would you do if Jesus came up and started talking to you? Well, they run back to the 11, and they go into the room, and they say, you won't believe it. He was here. We saw him. It is true. And everything that the Bible has talked about has pointed to, to what just happened. And before they knew it again, there's Jesus with his hands that are wounded, with his feet that are wounded, with the, a hole in his side. He says, and this is what I appreciate, I'm hungry. Give me some food. Ghosts don't eat but someone who has been risen from the dead can. And then this group that were so terrified that they were hiding for fear of being persecuted, so terrified that they denied even knowing who he was, suddenly they come bursting out of the safety of this room, and they go to Bethany, and there Jesus is taken from them. And their response is not to go back and hide in that room. Every day the Bible lets us know that they were in the temple, and they were sharing this good news, no longer afraid of death and persecution. And we know something got a hold of those disciples because they started a movement that has gone over the entire world. They started this community of faith, and when the Holy Spirit came upon them, even greater things were able to happen. We don't have this text on the screen or in our bulletin, but, but Acts says, They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Because this good news had a hold of them and they could not keep it silent, people were being drawn and people continue to be drawn into this community of faith, into this movement this day, even here at the United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay. I spent yesterday afternoon and, and last Saturday afternoon, I'm going to spend a little bit of time this afternoon talking with 14-year-olds about their faith. That's fun. It is fun. These children, some of whom were baptized as infants within this sanctuary, are now coming up to the point where they're ready to take the same membership vows that those of you who have taken membership vows took. They're ready to be a participant, a full participant in the life of this community of faith, this community of faith that started way back in Jerusalem with Resurrection Sunday. Now, I've been working full-time in a church for almost 30 years, and for almost all of that time, every time we talked about taking vows and membership, we promised our prayers, our presence, 
our gifts and our service. Does that, does that ring a bell for some of us? And now the Methodist Church adds a very important thing. Witness. Witness. How do we witness to the resurrection of our Lord and Savior? How do we give witness to the fact that God has a claim of our lives? We give witness through our presence, our prayers, our gifts, and our service. And this is something that we need to work together. We need to understand that we're partnering with this group of 14-year-olds that in just a couple of weeks are going to stand before you and take their vows of membership. Working together. And the more people you have, sometimes the harder that becomes. One of my favorite wedding illustrations, I think, is going to serve us well here today. Anyone used to be a Letterman watcher, David Letterman? No? Very few of you. Maybe you were more Johnny Carson or Jack Parr, or I don't know, uh, going way back. And, and uh, David Letterman had a regular guest who was the curator of the Columbus Zoo, Jack Hannon. And he came one day and he brought an animal. Now, when you're watching the show, you always wanted the animal to do something weird, like nest in Dave's hair or, you know, to chew on his, his thing. But he brought this little turtle with two heads. And he said, you know, in nature, conjoined twins happen about statistically just as much as it happens within human birth. The difference is, in nature, animals with two heads or conjoined twins don't often make it. Now, this was a little turtle. It had the same shell, the same walls, the same home, but it had two heads. And he named it Mary, Kate, and Ashley for the Olsen twins, back those of you who know that. And he said, usually this, this animal would die in nature. You see, the left head controlled the left. Do they have feet and arms? Or would you, are they all feet? Are they all arms? The left digits. And the right hand controlled the, the, the right ones. And what would happen a lot was they would fight with each other, and both would try and kick their own way, and it wouldn't go anywhere. Or, or one would just kind of uh, take charge, and so it would just kind of scoot around in a circle, and it never went anywhere. And I love this as an illustration for marriage because when we're married, sometimes we butt heads, right? Or sometimes we just marry one. To, but we have these, these heads, and they need to be focused on the same thing in order to work together to get to where they're supposed to be. So too it is with the church. We need to have our focus, the same focus, the focus of our mission to develop uh, committed disciples who love, who care, and who serve, just as it says here on our altar, who love God, who care for others, and who serve in the world. That is how we give witness. Witness. But what if we allowed Jesus Christ to be the head, and then we fall in line as the arms and the feet? And so... We have just a very brief sermon series to reflect on our vows of membership so that we too can celebrate with these young ones who are going to come in. But I want us to think of it in, in a different way. Let's think about a fist just for a second. Um, you know, when we, when we make a fist, usually good things don't happen right? When we make a fist, it's usually just because we're so angry, or we make a fist to shake at somebody, and you know, Jesus can't really do a whole lot with that kind of a fist. We squeeze so tight, clench so tight that our knuckles turn white. But as Christy tried to explain with the youth, if we have clenched fists, rarely can we help or make a difference. And when we have a clenched fist, certainly God has no room to put anything else in there. It is when we open our hand that we can truly be in love and service to others. And it is when we open our hand that God can put more back into our hands. And so let's look at FIST as an acronym. Uh, you know, anyone watch the Blues Brothers movies? And, you know, Jake had his name tattooed on his, fore, on his uh, hands. But what if we think of an acronym for FIST as financial gifts, intercessory prayer, service, time and talent? These four things that we promise to use to, to help us in our witness. And what if that fist was, was open to all? Deuteronomy says, open your hand to the poor and needy, the neighbor in your land. And we remember that Jesus calls us to love our neighbors as ourselves. And so I want us 
take a look first at the F in that, the financial gifts. And you're thinking to yourself, oh, oh, it's that sermon. It's that sermon. Well, we hear these words from a, a church that was established right when this movement was getting going, these disciples who were still on fire from the second letter to the church in Corinth. The point is this. The one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, which means we have open hands, you may share abundantly in every good work, as it is written. He scatters abroad, he gives to the poor his righteousness. Through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and by generously, by the generosity of your sharing with them and with all others while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God that he has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So how are we doing, Whitefish Bay? How are we doing? I'm a big sports fan. I, I have all the ESPN channels, and, and I like some of the original programming that ESPN puts out. And, and they had one show called The Five Reasons You Can't Blame So-and-So for Such-and-Such. Such. Let me give you an illustration. Remember that really painful Packer loss where all we needed to do was recover the onside kick? Seattle, no, we've, we've blocked that out. And, and what happened was the onside kick came and it was coming right to the hands of one of our tight ends, one of the people whose job it is to catch the ball and he didn't catch the ball and we vilified him. This ESPN would have said top five reasons you can't blame Bostic for not uh, you know, catching the ball. And so I wanna spin it a little bit. What are the top five reasons people don't support their community of faith financially? What are the top five reasons why, when it comes to this, we, we choose to have a clenched fist instead of an open arm? Well, number five. We have to do it in revert, you know, Letterman countdown style. Number five, because we are a society in debt. We are a society that is in debt. The, the statistics would be overwhelming. I don't need to give them to you. But we know that as a society, we have a national debt, but the average uh, debt in each household is staggering. Whitefish Bay is not immune from that. We're in this debt because we seem to blur the line between what we want and what we truly need. We live in a society of instant gratification. Even if I don't have the cash, I can just, this magic card, this magic card just swipe in its mind, instant gratification. And so, when we allow ourselves to be in a staggering debt, it's hard to support a church. Number four, I want to call this one, the pastor drives a Ferrari. Wait a minute, I give all my money to this church, and the pastor lives in a mansion and drives a Ferrari? FYI, I don't drive a Ferrari, and I don't live in a mansion. But we, we've seen these stories of these, these uh, uh, TV evangelists that have been busted for, for inappropriately using the funds. Jim Baker had a doghouse that cost $100,000 back at the time where the average home in our country only cost about fifty. We see this, and we see this, and we, and we say, what is going on with that? I don't want my money to support anything that might even closely go to something like that. I see my church, in my opinion, spending money lavishly on something that I don't want to support, and so I withhold. What it really boils down to is, can I trust the church with my treasure, with my money? Can you trust the United Methodist Church? that we are going to be good stewards with what you work so hard for? Can you trust that we're really going to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit those who, who are in prison or who are sick? Number three is a mentality. How much does it really cost to run a church anyway? Well, I don't, I don't understand why it costs so much money to, to, to run a church. Congregations don't understand or they are simply uninformed. They have this mentality, well, let volunteers do it. 
Certainly we have volunteers. And so I say to the person who says that, well, how are you volunteering? Well, not me. You know, somebody else is certainly going to do that. Or the, the mentality, somebody else is probably going to give enough to, to make up for what I am not going to give. But friends, what we need to know is when we start having to make cuts, the ministry, the mission is always the thing that suffers. And why is that? Because the maintenance has to continue. The lights still need to come on. The building still needs to be heated for the children and the, the, the two schools that we have in the, in the school for seniors. And everything that we do here, there are costs. You see, the baby boomer generation uh, has kind of gifted the church with this mentality. I'm only going to give my money to support only those things that I am personally passionate about, which is how we end up with these silos. My money is only going to go to this. Well, how are we going to keep the lights on? One of the things that blew me away is my daughter, Naomi, who's my youngest one. She's a senior in high school this year, going to go off to Madison next year. She evidently listened to one of the sermons I gave once when she was young. You see, we taught our kids by teaching, I mean, we made them tithe. Anytime they got any money, the 10% had to go to the church, 50% had to go to their savings account, and 40% is what they were able to use for their own enjoyment. And even though they mumbled and grumbled about it then, they certainly like their bank accounts now. But my daughter was legalistic, and that kind of made me uncomfortable, but legalistic about her tithing. She would write checks for like $2.35 because that was exactly 10% of what she got. But she would always write on her envelope, heat or lights, toilet paper, utilities. She understood that those are the things that make all the other ministry possible. But we have two left, and they're the serious ones why we can't blame most people for supporting a community of faith. Far too often there is a lack of a compelling vision. A lack of a compelling vision. We don't support what we can't see. You know, at this point in history, more than ever, the church is getting less and less of the, the, the money that is donated. The nonprofits that aren't church-related are doing a much better job at showing people through commercials, through their mission, how money given to them really is making a difference. When the people look at the United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay, can they see the good that we do? Are we clearly communicating to you all the things that we are doing to help to feed the hungry and to clothe the naked and, and to, to witness to our faith beyond these walls? We need to communicate that we're not doing this to build our own kingdom, but that we are trying to be faithful to our mission to develop disciples who love, care, and serve. But the number one reason we really can't blame people for not supporting the church is because we haven't done a good enough job letting people know what God's plan is. How God calls us to be people who share you know, the Bible does not condemn wealth anywhere, but it does condemn the attitude of hoarding. There is a spiritual gift of giving to help support the mission and ministry, which is why both Jesus and Deuteronomy say, open your hand and watch the way you're going to be blessed. As you walk your way through the building this week, you're going to see these little signs. And the signs say, it's coming. May 21st, it's coming. If you go to the men's room, it's right there on the... It, coming, May 21st. Here's what's coming May 21st, Consecration Sunday. That day that we are going to say, this is what I estimate my level of giving to God is going to be through the United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay. And, and there's something I need to let you know so that you, you can know that you can trust us. For a number of years, our budget has had to come down and down and down. This year, we have already established a budget for the next fiscal year, which is something we haven't done in a number of years. I think this year's budget was passed October, November, something like that. This year, we know exactly what we want to do. Our budget is set, and this budget is a 1.9% increase. And you say, well, if we've been going down, 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 why do we have the confidence that we as a community of faith are going to do enough mission and ministry that we need to have a 1.9% increase? And so let me share with you that through the first quarter of this calendar year, 
we are averaging 98 people more each and every week. Almost 100 more people each and every week. Through the first three quarters of our fiscal year, we have raised $91,000 more than we did last year year to date, all while spending $2,000 less than we did. Good things are happening here. Mission and ministry are happening here, and we are all a part of it. With Christ as the head, and you and I as the hands and the feet. But friends, it's not just about finance. It's not. It's also about that I, intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer is what really fuels the church. Our prayer lives, collectively and individually, fuel the church even greater than our financial gifts. We've been using this passage from James uh, for our anointing and for our, our healing services. You know, these words should be familiar to us now. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. And here it is. And pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Pray. Intercessory prayer. Pray for others. If you want better pastors, don't call the bishop. Pray for the pastors you have to be the pastors you need them to be intercessory prayer. Not all of us are going to be on the front line. Not all of us are going to be able to be out at Feed My Starving Children or some other mission opportunity we have. Not all of us can go to the United Methodist Children's Services Home or be a part of our feeding programs. But we all can do the important work of prayer. In the Old Testament, when God was putting God's people together, Aaron and Moses and her, they weren't called to be on the front line, but they were involved in the battle nonetheless. They were up on the hill with the arms raised in prayer that, that God's people might be faithful to, to what God had them up. Intercessory prayer. And I want you to know that, that the Holy Spirit intercedes on your behalf. Jesus Christ is the one great mediator between God and humanity. I've had many conversations with you, and you say, prayer is hard. I, I feel like I don't know what to say. I don't know that I'm being heard. Cling to that promise that the Holy Spirit intercedes on your behalf, that the Holy Spirit knows what it is you need, what your desires are, and is going to make known to God. With life of intercessory prayer, remember that intercessory prayer takes persistence and that persistence wins. We are an increasingly an impatient society, and prayer is a slow and long journey. You may need to pray for something for a season of your life, but do not quit praying. Prayer is the serious work of the church. As Richard Foster says in his classic, A Celebration of Discipline, if we truly love people, we will desire for them far more than it is within our power to give them, and this will lead us to prayer. Intercession is a way of loving others. And so, friends, to pray is to change. Prayer is the central avenue God uses to transform us individually and all the systems that we are a part of. I loved that video for the Feed My Starving Children. They didn't just pack and then put them on a pallet and bind them up and then give a high five. What did we see them doing? Every meal is prayed over. And in praying for those meals, we're praying for those malnourished children all around the world whose lives are going to be changed because of a nutritious meal. And so I want to issue a challenge to you this week. A challenge I hope you will take seriously. Your homework for this week. The first thing I want you to do is to be in prayer about what kind of an estimate of giving you are going to bring forth on May 21st. How are you going to be able to financially support this kingdom work that we're about of? Remembering that if the amount raised is, is less than what we intend for our budget, it's the ministry that's going to suffer not the maintenance, because that has to happen. But 
I'm going to make you even a little more uncomfortable. The last task I want you to do this week is to be intentional about praying for someone other than yourself. I challenge you this week, even if you're not a journaler, even if you don't like to write things down, and, and some of us never have to use pencil or pens at all anymore because we can do everything with our thumbs and our fingers. Make a prayer list. Each day, write down three, seven names of people that you've been praying for. And friends, in writing that name down, you are lifting that person in prayer and the Holy Spirit intercedes. Seven days of intercessory prayer. The church, the pastors, our world, our country, your friends, your family. And just see how God might change you. And so, dear friends, I invite you to join with me in a prayer that is here for all of us. And so let us join together in one voice as we lift up these words. Transforming, Transforming God, God, we cannot, we cannot sow, sow our seed with clenched clench fists. Help us to open our hands, to let go of grasping, that we too may scatter with hope and generosity our seeds of justice, peace, and joy. So may the fruits of our harvest be for the sharing of the earth and the blessing of your love. Amen. And so I